I know Dobro Jutro is, is morning, so this is afternoon, so this is Dobro, Dobro something, you know, Dobro Dan. Um, uh, welcome, consolidation. I, uh, my name is Pete. Uh, this talk is about consolidation, and I have done consolidation many times, so this is a bit of frustration. Not again, okay? Uh, however, there is a new dimension to it. We now can consolidate into cloud, or into Amazon, or Oracle Cloud, or any cloud provider you can think of. Before, like two, three years ago, consolidation meant we put everything on one piece of hardware or we put everything in one room or in one bunker. And most of the consolidations that I've been involved with did not go all that well. So some of that is here. My name is Pete. If you Google for simple Oracle DBA, you will probably find me. You can even type in yandex.ru, simple Oracle DBA, and you can still find me. I also have a Yandex email account, by the way. Um, Oracle Ace, Oracle... Stuff. This is what happens if you work with Oracle for too long. Um, this is how I normally go to conferences. But uh, this was a little bit too far, and the insurance was a bit... Hmm, so I am here by airplane. But normally I take motorcycle to conferences. My customer list. Really proud of all my customers the last 15 years or so. This one is almost 20 years ago. Um, if your company has a nice colorful logo, and if you want that logo on the slide, you need to give me a call. We can arrange that. No. Um, click, click. This, this, this is my intro, I like this. I have been in the swimming pool on top of that building. Yep. I have worked like this for just one day. It's very warm in a chip factory. Most of the time my work involves sitting at the desk and drinking coffee. So this is what I do. There we go. Now, today I want to talk about a little bit about the history of consolidation. What's happened? How often did we do that? I'll describe the case that we had. Our latest consolidation, it's about two years ago now, was just a, a clever salesperson who sold my customer a solu solution and that involved consolidation. Uh, why and how we'll go over that. I will say that when we consolidated on hardware, that was generally, hmm. We've consolidated into cloud, but it's not really consolidation, it's just putting things in Amazon. That worked a little bit better. The, the reason for it all, the incentives were the same, the results were probably better. What do I, how do I see it? Well, will it work, consolidation? It depends. When you leave this room, you should know when you can consolidate and when you should probably not consolidate. Maybe. So this is your homework. There will be an exam afterwards. No. So has it ever worked? Yes, it has worked, but in, in rare cases. And maybe, is anyone in the room here who has experience with consolidation projects? Like put all IT systems in one. Yeah, you are a consolidation. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks. Um, if we have time, we can discuss if there's no time, we, we should discuss over coffee. I, uh, I'm gen I will be around for the rest of the day. I like my coffee. No. How often did we do this? Well, in like 1989 or so, you had a database, and a database was on a server. And then someone said, oh, I need more databases. Can you put them on the same server? Yeah, so we ended up with the two, three, 10, 15 databases on one server. Oracle-wise, is there anyone here who has like 20 databases on, a, on one piece of hardware? Yeah. So 20 database instances on one server. Yeah. Okay, the, the highest I ever seen was 105. And it broke. It, it, it failed. <laughs> yeah. hmm? It was a, at that point, it was a Sun with 32 CPUs in it. So if you did a CPU count, you ended up with 32. If you run 100 databases on that, you have a, a 100 times the background processes. That, that, that is just going to melt. So that, yeah. You should probably, I have some metrics, but you should probably not have more uh, databases than CPUs. I would say if you, have, uh, if you want to consolidate 10 databases, you probably need 24 CPUs or so. I, I would use a factor of two, but there are other people out there, no, you can easily do that. Yeah, I know you can, but you can do that if your databases are very quiet. You probably are. So how many, uh, anyway, multiple databases on one server. 
then someone could, oh, we have a VM farm, so we have many, many servers. We can go back to one database per virtual server, but they run on a piece of hardware that is probably one large server with VMs on it. Consolidation. Then there was consolidation with OPS and RAC. OPS, anyone? Yeah, yeah. ancient. Oh, okay. um, RAC was perfect for consolidation because you can have a really big database. You can even use more than one server under the database. Was it solid? Was it reliable? Eh, maybe, if you were very careful with it. Of course, very quickly, you have a cluster, so why not put multiple RAC databases on multiple servers? So you've got one, two, three, four servers, and on top you put one, two, three, four, five RAC databases. Becomes a total mess. Many, many Oracle homes. Patching was a disaster. It was consolidation. Yeah. Um, then they came up with RAC one node. This was probably reasonably reliable. You have a RAC cluster where you can potentially run cluster databases, but you only run one instance. That way you don't have the instance communication problem. You don't have the brownout period when an instance goes down. Um, running a cluster of machines and having rack databases, but only use one node per database, probably a reasonable way of running it. Does anyone do that here? Rack? Do you, you know, do you use rack multi-node multi or just single node? Single node, yeah. And, and that, is, that probably works. Yeah. More or less. Yeah, I ah, see it really works. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> um, next is uh, 12C, and we will have pluggable databases. When, when I learned about it, I was like, you must be kidding. But they were serious. The, we are going to have uh, plug-in databases in a container, and they even share the, 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 the global area, so they will share the memory. You will end up with uh, three, four, five, maybe 20, 100 plugged in databases, sharing the same memory area on a machine. I am really curious to see how that works. But that is consolidation, of course. Uh, and you can run 12C on multiple servers if you want. Is anyone on 12 here, Oracle 12? Yeah. Uh, single node or multi-node? Uh, hmm? Single and multi. OK. So you have a rack database. Oracle 12 with multiple instances running? For test. For test, okay. And uh, plugins, do you use pluggable databases on them? For test purposes. For test purposes, okay. We need to talk. I, I'm really, I'm curious how that's going to pan out. Um, so how did we do it? Well, basically, for the last 20 years, we have either been moving pieces together or moving pieces apart. So we just push those databases around and hope they work. This is how I feel when people talk about consolidation. Uh, our mission about it's now two and a half years ago, our mission became to put as many database from high up, so boss boss, um, move all Oracle databases to Exadata. And the first machines we were given were X22s and later we got X42s. At the time we did this, this was already old hardware. So Oracle basically gave my customer a bunch of old machines. There you go. I said, mm, yeah. And uh, after you've consolidated, you will power down the old servers. This was where the economy comes from. You switch off the old machines. So they use less power, they use less management. And by the way, you don't have to pay for those licenses anymore. This was the savings part. Um, big smile. Because basically you can move to new hardware, but someone will probably take the old hardware and use it for something. Or the migration goes wrong or consolidation doesn't quite work and you keep running the old hardware. This sort of saving is difficult to realize because there is always a push to keep the server going. Yeah, and, and, and even if you can switch the server off, there is a DBA who says, I'd like to keep that old server because that's my test machine. Yeah, okay, <laughs> yes. Um, the Japanese have a word called oshia. Anyone? This one. This is the uh, this <laughs> a push, you know. And this is most consolidations are like this. And look, look at the customer. It, you know, happy. <laughs> Maybe this customer is mandatory there. He has no choice. You can consolidate if the customer has no choice. He, there is nowhere to go. He needs to get on the train. 
And this is how I see consolidation of it. So this time, we had to consolidate. Why? Well, here is my happy business user coming in. Um, we need more databases. We have more systems, more databases, more factories, more offices. We need databases. So what happens is the business asks for systems, and IT provides. There is a provider, and these people are located in Germany and in Malaysia and, and in India. They are an outsource company, and they will say, yes, we can. We will make database, because for every database, they get paid, and they get busy. So you want more databases? We give you more databases. And it's good training for our people, because they can create a database. They might make a mistake, but then we'll do it again, and we'll be a day late or so. So you end up with something like this, a huge storage room, a data center, full of databases, and everyone is using something somewhere. And you, do you have this self-storage in Russia? When people put things in, yeah. they generally forget about it. Yeah. So you end Okay, but so you end up with a lot of dead databases. You end up with a lot of databases that are sort of used every now and then, maybe, sometimes. Um, but there was a little bit more. We had this uh, go-to-jail problem. This is why the boss of the boss wanted us to use Exadata consolidation. We had a growing project, so we had too much databases. The provider had just provided all the databases, happy to do. And uh, the license can, I mean, the, the license, or, I mean, uh, Oracle comes along and says, oh, you have too many databases. You are out of license. You have problem. We will go to court. Lawyers. Oh. Um, hmm. So yeah, the salesperson basically says, you are out of license. You need to pay fine. This is in contract. You have no choice. And the boss is, hmm. Uh, OK, says the clever sales guy. What if you buy some Exadata machines? And then we can probably forget about it. So if you sign this, we will not sue. And this is how consolidation happens. You know, this is how Exadata gets pushed out into certain customers. And this is the background of our consolidation story. It's not funny. This is not, we are not the only ones suffering from this. I know at least two customers who had this outside of my main uh, customers, there are probably people in the room, don't raise your hands, tell me over coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the deal was made, and, and look at this happy salesperson here. Um, the client needs to get out of jail. The client is business. They don't really have IT knowledge anymore. There is no DevOps team in the client. There is just business, and they shout, and we want system, and we want more systems. The uh, Oracle is, is happy. Oracle just needs to meet the sales target. So Oracle says, you have a problem. We have Exadata. We can fix. And th there is my Exadata machine. They, they just run in, they roll into the data center, basically. The uh, provider, the DBAs, the system guys, they are happy. They get a referral fee for selling Exadata. So they get a, a percentage from Oracle. And the, the people at the provider, and, and you are probably DBAs, they were really happy because we get to play with Exadata. So we can put this on our resume that we have Exadata experience. You know, everyone is really happy with this. So you get this hop, yup. And a couple of months later, my, my boss wasn't so happy. There are a few other forces still happening. Because this is a business, they don't care about IT. IT is like uh, cleaning the office. IT is like uh, we need electricity, we need IT, we need cleaning, we need coffee, we need a canteen, uh, we need Exadata, maybe. <laughs> there is, the business doesn't care. It just has to, we need to run a process. We need to sell stuff, we need to process data, we need to consolidate. Every month we need to print a report, basically. And we need IT to print that report, can you please print it? It, IT is not really the business problem. And then the project. You need to move a system from A to B. You need to move a database from one old hardware to a new sort of old Exadata. The project people who do that, they are not interested in moving the database. They are interested in the signature. They have a package. They need signature. Whether you sign it, your neighbor, your enemy, uh, whoever is in your apartment, they need a signature. They need to finish a project. They are not interested in a working system. They don't care about the system. They need signature. This is project life. Anyone, any project managers in the room? 
Ken, I, I, I don't blame you, you know. I want to be your friend. <laughs> um, but the project manager basically just wants to declare success. So the quicker and the easier and the more simple he can get the signature, he, he can go. He needs to be inside budget. That's all he cares about. Uh, IT, the provider, is happy. Oh, we get to move database. We get to spend time on it. We, we can bill hours. We can write hour, hour, day, day, hour. Uh, they do a lot of extra work. They, are n they don't have an incentive to do this efficient. They have an incentive to spend a lot of time because they get paid by the hour. The more hours they spend on it, the better it is for them. So you have the, uh, the project, IT business doesn't care, project guy is in a hurry for signature, and IT provider is fine to leave all the problems there because problem will surface next month and we can spend time on it. This is job security. Uh, yeah. mm. See, uh, beginning to understand why consolidation is not a good idea. Um, so there we go. Remember the uh, keynote guy with Indiana Jones? Hey, he stole that from me. Um, <laughs> implementation is it's a management decision. We, it must happen. We have to do this. There is no escape. So the business can say, oh, maybe we don't want to test. We don't have time to test. Business not interested. We need to run the process. You need to print my report. There you go. The uh, provider sets the rules because they know they sit on top of the exadata. The exadata is in their data center. They determine the environment. It is a must-use service or the customer cannot escape. The migration method, I had no say in that and the business doesn't really care so you do an export-import because that is simple and it takes a lot of time. Uh, testing, that needs time. We don't have time and by the way, we don't change the system, we just move it, right? So there is a bit of a version difference often. And uh, our biggest problem was DRP, because they, the existing system had a data guard DRP, and in the planning, the whole sales cycle was sort of forgotten that they need a, a standby database for production systems. This became a problem after go live, because the IT provider could only provide a uh, you know, data guard, anyone? Data guard, yeah, okay. We were only allowed to implement data guard on production system. But to implement a, database, a data guard, you have to be production, so you have to be live. How can you test if you cannot implement data guard in production? So you had to go and migrate the system, declare production, we are live, and then you were allowed to build the data guard behind it. Now building a data guard copy is at least a few days work and you should probably test that. The testing is difficult because you are live. So the test is actually moving the live system over. It's not elegant. You know, this is what happens when a project is in a hurry. Um, and uh, this is how uh, we felt when we, I am part of what they call the intervention team. We should go and have a look if things go wrong. And this had gone, this was a bit like, uh, what is happening? Okay, so run. But there was no way to run, we had to fix it. We fixed it to a point. Um, the business, the users, the, the people who need to print a report, who sit behind screens, they discover that uh, it hasn't really been tested. So some things don't work quite. Uh, testing would require an extra system and there was no extra system. There are restrictions. All of a sudden you can't use sys packages anymore. Software breaks if it can't use sys packages. If you haven't tested this, you will discover this about one week into life and then the system is live and there is no way back. Whoops, yeah. bad testing. Um, patches, Exadata, who's, who's running Exadata? How do you, what is your patch frequency? Uh, four, times. Hmm? four times. Four times. Quarterly, okay, that, that's reasonable. And do you dictate, do you have a business, do you tell the business that it's happening? Uh, it's centralized actually. We have yeah. a special team uh, who are looking after all the uh, work yeah. operations. And they are dictated. They, yes, they di but they are in charge. So they dictate when it happens. And uh, this business was used to, you know, outage was something, they got a mail and then they had a meeting and they decided, oh, we can do that on Sunday night or something. Now, in this case, the IT guys, well, now we do that on Tuesdays because Tuesday is patch day. Uh, guess what? The manager of that team was ex-Microsoft. <laughs> uh, so basically, patches got dictated by IT. Patches on the exadata suddenly happen in working time. Huh? Yeah, it's in contract. Oh, interesting. Yeah. 
Um, the IT admin, the DBAs, were not really ready either. They, they discovered Exadata. One of the things I got in, in a mail was, no, no, we only just got this system, we are learning. I said, yeah, I guess so much. The, basically, the operators, the, the DBA, were was, was not really DBAs that go to conferences or anything. They, they were DBAs who had the certificate, Oracle Certified Professional. And they were uh, in an operator role and they knew the database, but ASM was moi, and uh, things like uh, listeners, IP addresses, network problems on Exadata, uh, slightly clueless. They were not really used to handling root. They were a bit afraid to log on with root, actually. Um, and there was no runaway monitoring, so something hangs, something stops, locking, Runaway processes, nobody noticed until the user says, something's wrong. So you log on and say, yeah, I think you have some sort of locked process running on. No babysitting. You know, all the, this all goes wrong, and, and the list is endless. Um, for example, the, uh, the migration method. The first system you migrate is a small uh, two gigabyte database. You do an export, you do an import, it's tested, it's fine, Exadata is working, good. Uh, the second system is a 10 gig database. You do an export import and it's sort of working. And after a while, you run into the 100 gigabyte systems. And then export import is really slow. But this was the, the method of migration. So the, the, one of the first things that went wrong was a, an office that complained our, our system is going down for two days because someone is migrating. And that's when my boss got involved and he said, can you have a look at that Oracle system? That's when we discovered they migrate using export-import. Um, we told them to use data pump, but even data pump is relatively slow. Anyone data pump? Yep. And, and then you need to tell it how many. Yep. Um, we asked for uh, the database links. But no, nope, the network between the old and the new bunker was, no. Yeah. Um, we asked for RMAN, ran into version problems because 11.202 11 is different from 11.204 exadata. We asked for standby and cutover, and again, version problem. So what you should do is upgrade your old system before you migrate. Remember that? Lesson one, upgrade old system and then migrate. But that's extra work, extra testing. You don't have test time. Streams. Has anyone used streams? In some projects, not specifically Oracle streams, but any sort of local. Yeah, yes. Uh, you Golden Gate, probably, or something similar, or the uh, Quest Shareplex. Oracle streams, forget it, okay? <laughs> but <laughs> Oracle discovered that. Uh, I tried uh, streams in 2011 and 2012. It never worked. It, 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 it just didn't work. Um, so we, we tried all sorts of alternatives to migrate, but it was a difficult battle with the DBAs who really wanted to use export-import if they could. So we ended up doing a couple of RMAN copies anyway. But this became a tedious process. After the first uh, 10 or so databases, they did the small ones first, and then they start doing the large ones. And what works for a small database may not work for a really significant database, anyone. Uh, even more, you know, it, if it rains, it really rains. Um, the disaster recovery plan, data guard. Um, the other systems have a data guard copy, and we do VIP failover. You know, the IP address fails over to another site, and you can connect, and everything works. Not on the Exadata system. You can't fail over the VIPs, apparently. Uh, so that was all untested. Failover would just work, right? We have a standby, we can bring up the standby. No, no, you need to tell the application where the standby is, that sort of thing. We had to declare a number of test systems to be production and pay the production fee for them to even test data guard. Because data guard apparently was only allowed on production system and when the system was production, it was too late to implement data guard. So we ended up having a lot of meetings about this and pay extra licenses for data guard on accept and stuff like that. This needs to go in the plan. This is why a plan needs to be made by a DBA. Uh, capacity monitoring and babysitting. We had hanging processes that would eat a CPU forever. And if you have 24 CPU threads in an exadata, if you have 22 processes running away, the system becomes slow. Uh, AWR will see that problem, but basically it goes wrong if AWR knows there is a problem. The runaways, so runaway, the, how do you call it? Endless loop processing happened, and the only time we saw that was when it actually 
had stopped the machine. That was not elegant, you know. Uh, we also had a migration where the file system was full because those dumps, they FSTP, FS, what is it? Uh, SFTP them over, very old fashioned. Oh no, it's just safe, it's between two data centers, it's safe, safe. Okay, F FTP is faster than SCP, by the way, that's why they did it. But uh, we ended up with file systems full, so we got half a dump. Uh, you discover that when the dump breaks on the import, that sort of thing. There is one the main problem of consolidation is probably this, is noisy neighbors and capacity. The IT provider said something like, oh, you should behave like good neighbor, you know, after we had a few runaway processes. You should behave like good neighbor. If you make too much noise, other business will notice because the system stops. Um, we had noisy batch windows. We had memory leaks. We had especially the 2300 uh, DBMS stats. And once you have 10 databases that go stats calculation at 11 o'clock, you go, eh. We had the problem of parallel degree. Anyone have the, the problem of not enough parallel processes? On so that when parallel queries begin to hang, all of a sudden, yes, see, yeah. Okay, we ran into that. Of course, you need to set the dot manually if possible. We had log and trace files grow forever. We had slowdowns, and this, this is an unexplained one. Does anyone know why Exadata would slow down on Saturdays? Yeah, we, we could all, yeah. Uh, I did some maintenance window uh, in the resource profile, which is defined to okay. verify some background activities like task maintaining uh, queries. And because it, so you think it is Oracle background process anyway. We, we don't, we have no good explanation for this. We, we didn't think it was Oracle. We thought they, someone was using a disk copy mechanism or a backup thing, but that, that on Exadata, that wouldn't exist, would it? So we, we still have slowdowns, or we had slowdowns on Saturday in the morning, basically, the morning of Saturday. So we think we do maintenance, we think we do migration, we do uh, application con conversions on Saturday morning, and somehow my uh, disk response times on Saturday are lower. But no, we never found out exactly why. Um, all these problems, so who, who checks this? Well, nobody really. The users find out about them, and AWR then tells us what is wrong. We don't always know who's causing it. No. So should you, con th this is my consolidation horror story. Should you consolidate? Huh? Um, you know, consolidation is a bit like this. You have to do, ah! <coughs> anyway. um, yeah, I still think consolidation is possible, and I, I have more or less have examples of, of where consolidation went right. Um, but if you do consolidation for cost saving or for project manager reasons, if you do it for a bureaucratic reason, it's probably not going to work. If it is for cost savings, the short answer is uh, forget it. You know, and on paper it will probably look good. All the project get signature, you get a big pile of paper with signatures, well done. The user is not happy. You know. So on paper your savings might work. The extra effort to put all these systems together, the extra effort to put all the people on the train, it's just not worth it. Okay. Um, is it simpler to administrate a few large boxes instead of a hundred small ones? I don't know. I, I am of the opinion that I would rather have a uh, hundred identical systems that were relatively simple instead of two or three complicated systems where everyone is making noise and getting in each other's way. I, I'm in favor of uh, simple systems, and a consolidated system is by nature more complex. But unless you have iron standards and you determine exactly what kind of parameters, what kind of usage, what kind of connections you have, you, you have to be strongly in control and know what you're doing. Uh, so yeah, if, if you do it for simpler administration, less people, less labor, I don't really think that's going to work, but maybe. And it is not on purpose that everyone will do this with the best intentions, but then they, they end up building a complex system anyway. You are probably better off having a hundred small boxes instead of two really big ones, but this is a careful opinion. So benefits of consolidation, mm, only if you do it really well. You need to be a little bit lucky, you need really good planning, 
you need to know exactly what you're going to do. I think. So this is why if you live together with your um, partner, you sometimes shout at each other because you have to live together. You know, who is doing the dishes? You, you, you didn't put the garbage in. If you live together with your mother-in-law, <laughs> yeah, yeah. if you live together with 15 students in a house, you really have a problem. So I don't really think living together or putting systems together is going to work. You know, living with partner is complicated. Mother-in-law makes it complicated. If you have strange businesses, if you have a, uh, an office business that works on Monday and Friday, on a system, and you have another business that is a retail business, is more busy on Friday night than in weekend. Those two behaviors are theoretically good because they're balanced, but the management and the, the whole culture of those systems is different. So they will fight over the maintenance window. You know, It is difficult to put that sort of systems together, even on hardware. Um, patches become uh, a problem because you're going to fight over the patch window unless IT dictates. But if IT dictates the patch window, nobody's happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, troubleshooting is really complex because when the system hangs and, then there are, and you know that it's probably a CPU problem or the CPU is overloaded, you have to dig deep and find out who it is. Where do they come from? Who's got the memory leak? You know, who's got the runaway processes? It's more difficult to search that on a system with 10, 20 databases than it is on a single system with a box and a database and a simple something. Consolidate. Anyone been in the army? It works if you have the discipline. It works if you have a boss who's in control and everyone says, yes, sir. Then you can consolidate you know, the military. Was that fun? I don't know. Anyone been in the military here? Was it, was it fun? <laughs> hmm? Correct, depends on your position and, and whether you like physical exercise or not. Everyone has good memories on the military, but when you're in the military and you have to march 80 kilometers, no. no. So this is consolidation. This is what most consolidations look like. You have a huge building with a lot of small apartments and people are just pushed into it. Okay? Nobody really wants this sort of consolidation. You know, would you? Do you like? Yeah. But um, this, this I could do. This kind of consolidation you can do. So it will work if you can offer your business or your customers something comfortable, something better, now, if you can really improve the service. But if you are after cost savings, you're not going to improve the service. You're just going to force everyone to, to listen and obey and be as small as possible. So our consolidation was not a big success. My boss had a lot of trouble on it. I made a good living trying to diagnose what went wrong. We were saved by the cloud. This is my mandatory Oracle cloud uh, thing. Um, our customer actually discovered that they could go to Amazon. We have a virtual private cloud extension. We can start up Amazon instances, EC2s. We can use S3 storage if we want. And we discovered that we can use, um, we can use Amazon RDS. So I can start a database in the cloud. I don't have root access to it. I don't even have sys access to it. I have RDS admin access to it but Amazon will run that database for me, and I can even choose when, when it's backed up and when it's patched. Um, so we got the Amazon service to work. It's part of our network. Uh, to us, it was a lot cheaper than the exadatas in Munich and, and in India, and we could bring our own license, so we could start enterprise edition databases as well. This is probably key to some of the systems. Uh, some systems need enterprise edition license or enterprise edition Oracle software. Um, if you go to Amazon as a, as, as a regular consumer customer, you can only run standard edition from start. But if your company has a contract with Amazon for total services and, and virtual private cloud and whatever, you will be allowed to run enterprise edition, and that can be beneficial. You can use partitioning if you want. Yeah. Um, Amazon outages are predictable. There is no dictatorship, and every database can go down individually. They don't do this on a hardware basis with 20 databases going down and then back up. No. Every database can choose its own maintenance window. This is what they had before they consolidated. Uh, the main advantage is there is no bureaucracy involved for the IT provider. I don't have to negotiate with a, with a DBA who is in training, who's just discovering Exadata. No. 
Amazon is, is a console. There is no person involved. You click on a window, basically. Anyone using Amazon? Yeah. Console. Do you, does, do you use uh, RDS as well, remote data uh, services? No. Okay, but and and probably uh, EC2 instances as well. Do, do you use yeah, remote? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We we our customers started off using just machines, and they they literally discovered that hey, we can start up RDS databases as well. Click, and it's not expensive. It is paid by uh, by hour if you do that. We now have a few systems where you come into the office at seven o'clock in the morning and the system is not working because it only gets started up at eight because it's cheaper. Yeah. Um, with RDS, yeah, it's not always fun. With RDS, we got back our control. It was no longer the salesperson and the IT provider in charge. We could control our system again. We have choices. We can migrate using DB links. It's not very fast, by the way, because it is a link to Ireland somewhere. We, uh, we can use our man copies. There is a service you can send in a disk to Amazon and they can restore a database for you at a cost, but it works. Um, DRP is a standard. It is a matter of a few clicks and they will duplicate your database for you. You have point in time recovery, more or less from the console. It, it, you need to find out exactly how it works, but once you know where it is, click. You know. um, anyone familiar with RDS admin? This is the super user on an Amazon database. And actually, this super user has more privileges on the Amazon database than I have with my IT provider from, yeah, so quite happy with that. Okay. The Amazon service is reliable, more or less, for us. It works. I will put a caveat. I, I have nothing over probably 100 gig or so on RDS. So they are medium, small size databases. I don't know what's going to happen if I put a terabyte on it. My guess is it will work, but I will run into IOPS limitations. Um, the downside of going to a cloud provider is that you become responsible. You can no longer call uh, a manager from a DBA team and ask what is wrong with my database. You have to find it out for yourself. If you go to a cloud provider, you become responsible. So you need to have an IT knowledgeable person. And if you have a business where all the IT is totally evaporated, that can be a, a challenge. Yeah. You know, I, Amazon, RDS, and, and other cloud providers basically mean you still need a techie, or you again need a techie to mess with, to, to configure it for you. And the, the big advantage, of course, is you don't have the hardware in the basement, and it is more or less reliable. Somebody made all the mistakes before you. So we're back in control with RDS and relatively happy with it. This is not consolidation because I have maybe 30 RDS databases now and I, I have no clue whether they are on the same hardware or not. But I don't care. It works. Does that make sense? And it, it, it means you give away some of the control and responsibility and you need to monitor and make sure that it stays working. Yeah. So consolidation and RDS, they're not the same thing. You know, consolidation means you put stuff on hardware that is in the basement somewhere and cheaper. RDS means you give your data to someone in Ireland or anywhere and, and they run it for you. Uh, this is what consolidation felt like and this is what the cloud felt like for us. Uh, the Oracle marketing loves the second picture, of course, oh, cloud. But, but serious, if you have a cloud provider and you don't have to worry about the Oracle software at all anymore, Life becomes easier, yeah. And it will probably go wrong at some point in time, so I'll be back next year to tell you guys what, what, what went wrong. Uh, so should you consolidate? And then there was one management guy who came up with the example of a beehive. You know, bees, uh, a beehive splits when there are too many bees. The, the new queens go out and then you will have three or four new beehives. They never consolidate. And he said, in nature, he said, Nobody consolidates, nothing consolidates. It splits, it varies, and it is adaptable. You know, by splitting, you can adapt to different environments and different situations. Consolidation, there is no adaptation. Consolidation is a forced thing, and it will probably go wrong. That was his um, analogy. He said, a beehive only splits. He said, look at nature. Not, nothing in nature consolidates, it splits. 
it becomes more diverse. And this is possibly a lesson to learn. Um, so there we go. If you are going to consolidate, if your boss wants to consolidate, talk to him or uh, send him to me. Um, forced consolidation. If you force things to go in one place on one server, especially if it is software built in-house, so if it's not a, a bought system, if it's not a mature, more or less maintained system, but if you guys tweak together your own database and you maintain it, probably shouldn't force that to go together. There are too many people factors involved, there are too many technical problems, probably not ready for consolidation. If you have a standard system, a system where there are like a hundred installations in the whole world, and people know, and the provider knows how it runs, and you know your system, maybe you can consolidate those. Consolidation might work, but only if you can do it without your users noticing. And there, there is an example of that. Um, consolidation might work if your IT department knows exactly what it's doing, and if they can do it stealthy if they can do it without anyone noticing. If you have to go down for an export and an import and you need to test that and the business has to sign off on the test, that's a process and that probably goes wrong. You know, that's effort. If you have to do that effort, that's a sure sign consolidation won't work. But if you can do it without anyone noticing, if you can move the data and you don't tell anyone and the next morning it's just working, eh, you might be able to consolidate. Um, example that we have is email. Nobody knows where the email boxes are. Maybe you know there is an email server in the basement somewhere. And, and that's been migrated three or four times and nobody really noticed, except maybe you didn't have email for a day. You know, but email systems are an example of things that have been consolidated without too many people knowing. Nobody needs to test that email. Nobody signs off on an email user test. When you migrate a database, you end up with uh, user testing, integration testing, performance testing. Nobody does that for email. It just works. If you can get to the level where you can move your system around without your users noticing, then you might consolidate. That is my careful opinion. You have to be like a duck. You know, a duck is swimming. If you have a camera underwater for a duck, you can It's very busy. And at the surface, it's just quietly goes That's how you should consolidate. Um, if you go to cloud, your main bottleneck is your network. If you consolidate on a cloud, and it worked in our case, our RDS, our Amazon stuff, more or less work, we're happy with that. Um, in our case, medium-sized databases. I have nothing the size of a terabyte in Amazon yet. I have nothing that's using more than 16 CPUs in Amazon yet. Um, we had a, a virtual private cloud. We had a network connection already in place. If you go to a cloud provider, you need a network nerd in the house first. I see. Um, and we have a lot less, you, have, you just have less infrastructure to worry about, but you have to know what you're doing. Network is important. Probably start with small systems. Cloud, if you go to a cloud, you are responsible. You cannot really call Amazon. They don't answer the phone. You know, there is no person you can shout at. You have to stay actively involved. You have to determine where your systems go, what kind of configuration you do, whether you shut them down on the weekend or not. Um, you need to do that. If you go to cloud, you need to study it and, and know what you're doing first. You can't tell a project manager, put me in the cloud. You know, if you do that, you end up making the same mistake. If you just give it to a project manager and say, bring me to cloud, no, won't work. Also, if you go to cloud, your data is held hostage at Amazon. It is, look at the Amazon conditions. Getting data into Amazon is fairly cheap, even if you send them a, a large disk. Getting data out of Amazon is generally a penalty that you have to pay by the gigabyte and that sort of thing. Um, like I said, your network connectivity is vital if you go to the cloud. If you go to cloud, you still need to think about your IT. It's like with consolidation. If you don't think it's through right, it won't work. If you go to cloud, you have to think about it to do it right. Uh, you shouldn't take my word for this. Who is going to try this? Yep. Are you going to cloud or consolidate? Cloud. cloud. Yeah. RDS. Yeah. Because, and we have to spend all this time yeah. complicated. We actually tried to do it because we are there, but we can't uh, because it's drastic because Yeah. So some, some kind of problem for 
Yeah, you, you and, and then they probably tell you you need to configure your own EC2 instances and, and run your own system on that. You need to go one level deeper and run, run your own Linux. And that, that means you need to spend more effort, yeah. Anyone else going to cloud? Yes. You have a self-service model, but it is still an internal provisioning. Yes. Okay, so you, you keep a lot of control, and that means you need to keep the skills and the people. Yeah. Oh, thank you. What is that? Um, no. If you, if you consolidate or if you move to a cloud, you have to think of, uh, this is my favorite line, it has to be simple. If it's not simple, if you cannot explain it simply, it's probably too complicated and it will probably fail. Dijkstra is the professor who invented the software semaphores. So this is like a 50-year-old IT thing. Um, there is a German poet who says, limitation shows the master. Don't do anything stupid. Don't do anything complicated. Keep your system simple, move them simple, move them careful. You know, German poet, that's the one. Um, I'm done, actually. This was it. If you consolidate, if you can do it without your users noticing, maybe you can. If you need to test extensively, if you need to do complicated stuff to consolidate, probably not a good idea. Questions? Yes. Uh, but among, among the, the cons, uh, you bypassed the, the question of price for the long term. Yeah. Because you put it as, as a goal for, for the short term. And that's true. I think so, yeah. You buy the equipment and so forth. But yeah. uh, just based on your own experience and from the numbers you've seen on contracts, I believe yeah. you've seen those, uh, what would be the, uh, the price of? Yes, we, um, I've, I've seen numbers that I can only say that the monthly price we pay to provider is much higher than the monthly price we pay for an Amazon RDS comparable database. So in our case, our provider, which also hosts the Exadata and all our VM farms, is much more expensive than Amazon. They will claim to be more secure. They will claim to be all sorts of full service. And, and you do have a person that you can call and shout at. But uh, the, the provider of hardware and, and services is more expensive than the Amazon cloud at this point in time. I, it, it's, it's, it's a funny thing to say. I expect Amazon to become more expensive. You know, Amazon wants to get the market. And once they are in control, they, they probably raise prices. That's one. The other is Oracle itself wants to go into the cloud. So Oracle will make it more difficult and more expensive for other cloud providers to, to provide Oracle in the cloud. Um, all that comes together. The cloud will probably become more expensive and the providers will probably be discover that they lose market and become cheaper. I have no idea where the break even point is. I, I will say that I probably have time. Yeah, I have time. Yeah. Um, if, uh, if you go to a cloud system, as opposed to running your own hardware or renting hardware from a provider, um, you should probably do that to, to get rid of layers of management, layers of expertise, to, to, to reduce your workload. Or, so less work and more flexible. In a cloud system, you can fairly easily switch from a large database to a small database or from a small system to a large system. So you gain flexibility. You can maneuver 
more easily in a cloud than you can on, on hardware with long-term contracts. That is probably more important than, than just the, uh, the payback time. And with IT systems, they either run not as long as you think, you know, they, they are used for a few months and then we decide oh, it's not working, we do something else. Or they have a system that seems to work perfectly and they make it run for 20 years and then Windows 95 is outdated. It is very hard to predict whether a system will be long term or not, I, th I think. But uh, I, I know it's not quite the answer, but <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. This explains a lot because. Uh, yeah. Yes, the, um, there are uh, countries where the law or the mentality does not allow cloud usage. Like in, in, the, Bal in the Balkan, there are banks and, and places like that are obliged to have the data in their own premises. So it has to be in a building owned by the bank, that sort of thing. The Dutch government and some of the security services, like the police, are not allowed to use cloud services because they don't consider that safe. You know, I, I would turn it around and I would say uh, Amazon and encryption is probably more careful and more thought out than, than the security that you can build with two hobbyist guys in a police office, but you know, who am I? No. No. So I'm, I'm a bit skeptical. I, I think uh, good cloud services are probably better than what you can build in-house. But you, you can compete with that if you have the right expertise and the time and the mindset to do it exactly right. Yes. Yes, and yeah. that's why yeah. sometimes you are just given by the laws and regulation. And yeah, yeah, also, yeah. But uh, in Slovenia, for example, there is a, a company that says, no, our banks are obliged to keep the data in-house, so we, we need to sell them hardware. Yeah. Yeah. Does, that, does it work? Any question? Anything else? Who, who's yeah, are we, uh, how much? How many more minutes? <laughs> Am I out of time? Uh, yeah. Time to what? Yeah. Okay. Can. Uh, so yeah, you can uh, shoot the uh, hole. In, oops. You can shoot the hole in me now. <laughs> okay. Fine. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>